together, but we also get opportunities to learn from each other. I'm excited to be here because I've been in my role with the Education Commission of the States for seven years now, but this is our fourth year of being the home for the Arts Education Partnership. And before I go any further, I want to make sure to have some um, thank yous that I can share because we've had some really important partners who've helped to invest in the growth we've had at the Arts Education Partnership. First, I want to thank the National Endowment for the Arts and the U.S. Department of Education. As many of you know, AEP was established in 1995 through a unique interagency cooperative agreement between these two agencies. It's not easy sometimes to get these agencies to work together, let alone to have cooperative agreements to say we both believe in the same thing and want to make this happen. I'm really grateful for the NEA and the U.S. Department of Education that they chose ECS, the Education Commission of the States, to be the home, and we're really thankful for the collaboration that we've continued to have with them in the last four years. There's two other organizations that we owe a depth of gratitude to also for supporting our work and supporting a lot of what we're doing here at this annual convening. The Hewitt Foundation and the Wallace Foundation both have invested in AEP in various ways and their unwavering support has made our work at AEP impactful in multiple ways across the country. Please join me in thanking the National Endowment for the Arts, the U.S. Department of Education, the Hewlett Foundation, and the Wallace Foundation. I also want to personally thank the AEP Advisory Council, a group of national leaders for arts and education organizations who have been working with us a lot in this year of transition that we've had at AEP. I'd like to ask for all of the members of the Arts Education Council to please stand and be recognized for your work this year. We had a meeting yesterday which was very, very helpful. Um, we had it at the Kennedy Center's new REACH Center, which was tremendous. Um, and there's our picture outside on the lawn. If you have not been to the REACH Center, I'd urge you to talk with Mario from the Kennedy Center in the back there, uh, because they're in the middle of, they're on day five of a 16-day festival opening up the center. And it's a really, really amazing experience if you get a chance to go over there. Our time together today and tomorrow provides a coveted opportunity to focus on arts and education and particularly around research, policy, and practice that we're seeing around the country. We know that when we work together and share best practices, we achieve greater success. And that is exactly what the Arts Education Partnership is all about. AEP provides partner organizations and the broader arts and education field with unbiased research, relevant policy information, and opportunities to look at best practices. We do this through four key services that we provide research, reports, convenings, and council. This meeting is an example of one of our many convenings that we do throughout the year, where we bring arts and education leaders together to interact, collaborate, and learn from each other. We also host working groups and thinkers meetings. For a thinkers meeting, we bring experts together from around the country, sometimes arts leaders and experts, sometimes education experts, and sometimes politicians so that we can sit them in a room and think, what is actually possible on the policies that people are considering for arts and education? An example of this was in June, when we brought together 10 national leaders to focus on STEAM education. The outcome of that thinkers meeting is a, typically a report that showcases some best practices and ideas for states to consider. We were excited to release one of those reports just last week, which brings me to reports, another one of our key aspects of how we serve you. Throughout the year, AEP is producing relevant and timely reports providing arts and education leaders with concise, factual overviews and analysis on priority policies that are happening in the states. Since we were all here together, since we were last together in Indianapolis, we've released five new reports over this last year. A lot of them cover multiple issues in arts and education policy, including our new chapter on Title IV in ESSA, Mapping Opportunities for Arts, and as I mentioned, our recent report that was just released last week on the STEAM Thinkers meeting. If you haven't had an opportunity to read that report yet, it's highlighted on our new website, and among all of the other reports you see there, I'd urge you to look at this and see what are those opportunities that you could consider in your state or in your region. 
We also report out on important arts and education topics, such as the Arts Ed Digest, our bi-weekly newsletter, blog posts that we do, um, along with our success stories. And the success story project is one I would like all of you to talk with our staff about to help us highlight more. I think all of your organizations and all of the work you're doing, you have some success. We want to help you put that together into a one-page story that actually highlights what was the policy change, what was the implementation that you did with arts education, and what are some of the metrics that actually show that it made a difference in the lives of the people you were trying to touch. Those success stories for us are one way that we think we can help policymakers better understand where arts and education can actually be utilized together. On our website right now, we have nine of those success stories that are listed. We have others that are in the making, but we hope all of you will be engaging with our staff throughout the next couple of days to provide us with other ideas that we can follow up with you and hopefully put into a next, another success story. Research is one of the vital areas that we continue to track across the nation. We gather and compile information to help you and organizations improve your practice, build effective partnerships, and inform policy. ArtScan and ArtsEd Search are two examples of the research we do. ArtScan is a searchable clearinghouse of the latest state policies supporting education in and through the arts across our country. It covers 14 key policy areas in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. For those of you who aren't familiar with what we do with the Education Commission of the States, we actually like to read legislation. I'm going to say that again. We like to read legislation. We actually do 10 to 15 50 state comparisons each year. Some of these are on topics like charter schools or school accountability or on assessments, teacher licensure. We do these 50 state comparisons so that we can actually compare in an apples to apples way what are the policies in all 50 states and what could you learn from the other 49 states. As I like to say when I travel across the country and testify a lot in legislatures, I don't know what you need in your state. But we do know what the 49 other states are doing and there's a lot that you can learn from them to better understand what policies might be best for you to consider. The 2019 Art Scan at a Glance is included in your program on page 23. We update this every March with the help of C-Day and I want to especially thank C-Day for their ongoing support and collaboration as it's not easy to compare 50 different state policies and make sure that they're actually being viewed in the same capacity. I encourage you, when you have a time during the networking breaks, to stop by our kiosk that we have right outside by the registration, where we have staff who can help to walk you through ArtScan and walk you through our new website so that you can best use our services. ArtEdSearch is another unique tool, and this serves as the field's primary hub for research focused on the outcomes of arts education students and educators. All of the research that we provide is vetted through an internal Education Commission of the States review process, as well as an external review process with partners and higher education stakeholders. And I would be remiss not to take this opportunity to thank many of those who serve on our review panel and are going through multiple different research documents and helping to provide a quick and easy analysis for you that you can utilize through our Arts Ed Search. So far this year, we've added nine brand new studies to Arts Ed Search, and we have our next review with this team underway right now. Again, this tool is at our kiosk also, so that you can easily understand how to get your hands on the research that might be useful to show why your programs need additional help or should be integrated in a different way in the state, district, or school that you're working in. I've shared about our convenings, reports, and research, and last, but absolutely not least, is our council, one that we do the most when you think about how we engage with our stakeholders. Our stakeholders across the country are usually my seven commissioners in a state. By law in most states, my education commission of the state's commissioners are the governor, the chief state school officer, the chair of house education committee, the chair of senate education committee, usually a university chancellor or a university president. And so our ability to engage these policymakers in the work that you do for arts education is an extreme value. And the counsel that we're providing them is really important. One of the best ways that we do our counsel is actually through information requests. We get these when we get a call from a governor that says, I want to do this, but I don't know how. And if we don't have a paper that's already written on that, 
Within 48 hours, we write a four to eight page memo to that governor or legislator or chief state school officer that shows them what the research says on those policies and shows them what other states are doing and helps to provide them with technical assistance. Last year, we did 820 private information requests for governors, legislators, chiefs, and chancellors. And a lot of these were focused on issues related to arts and STEAM and arts and education. It's actually kind of funny to track these. We usually get an information request from a legislator in January. If the bill moved, the chief calls us in about February. And if the bill actually got passed, the governor calls us in May. We have the same information request, we just changed the name on the memo, but we can actually see which bills are tracking by where they're coming from those information requests. We are excited to be able to also counsel by traveling. We do a lot of travel across the country. Last year, we did over 450 trips into the states, meaning that we were there to provide technical assistance, to testify at one of the committees, or to work with some of the task forces that governors and chiefs have established. We attended and facilitated the Arts Education Policy Briefing in D.C. in March with Americans for the Arts. We were able to provide significant information for state data infrastructure projects with the National School Board Association on how to integrate arts into the state longitudinal data systems. We presented on STEAM at the Young Audiences National Conference in Houston in April. We hosted a panel discussion at our National Forum on Education which had leaders from Nevada and Ohio talking about the STEAM policies that they put in place in their states. And just in June, I got the honor of actually going to South Carolina. I didn't realize how humid it was in June in South Carolina. But I got the honor of going to actually tour a STEAM camp that was put on for an elementary school. And that was part of the work that had been done with Engaging Creative Minds, one of the partners who joined us last year. Robin Berlinski, who's here with us today, is the director of Engaging Creative Minds, and her blog on STEAM and what their STEAM camp is doing in some of these low-income school districts was actually released this morning, so I'd urge you to look at that blog. I got the honor of turning a corner at an elementary school thinking I was going to just walk into a camp and instead having 10 fourth graders spray me with silly string. So sometimes the trips are more serious, sometimes they're a little bit more relaxing. We really do appreciate being able to learn from you when we're out in the states and seeing the work that you're doing. And similarly, we hope that when you leave our 2019 annual convening tomorrow, you're gonna leave with new knowledge and an even stronger passion for the arts. Over the course of the next two days, we're excited to bring 15 different concurrent sessions to you, all led by dynamic presenters. You're going to hear from a student performer, we're going to honor the 2019 Young Artist Award winner, whose art is actually in your program, I believe, on page two. And we're gonna have Dr. James Lane from the Virginia Department of Education here later for a keynote presentation. I'm personally excited to hear his remarks because I've worked with him on a lot of issues over the last year, but he actually started his career as a band teacher. And now he's the Chief State School Officer for the state of Virginia. And our closing tomorrow is going to bring eight dynamic speakers to the plenary stage to share their perspectives on advancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and access in the arts and education world. We have a reception tonight that is being hosted and we look forward to having all of you there. We'll have information at lunch on the buses that can help to get you there. It's walkable, but we have buses available also because we wanna have the networking time with each of you. Also, in 2019, as the year is coming to a close, we have some changes that we're looking at doing with Arts Education Partnership. We have been actively preparing for what comes after our 2020 action agenda. We've been working towards a new AEP strategic mission focusing on a service model that will really focus on helping you build leadership and the capacity and knowledge that your organizations need to succeed. We've worked with Deliver Ed as a consultant to host a series of focus groups in DC, focus groups that are taking place on the phone with some of our advisory council members, and even this Friday, Friday the 13th, I don't know why we're doing a focus group on Friday the 13th, but in New York, David Dick with Young Audiences is hosting one of the focus groups looking at our strategic mission. We wanna be thankful for all of you who have participated, and we're really excited to be looking at the new action agenda that we will have that will be coming out in January of 2020. Our goal next year is to be focused on you and the engagement that we can have with you in so many different ways. In the big picture, we wanna figure out how we can have a strategic mission that sets metrics for our staff 
to guarantee that we are touching and connecting with each of you every single quarter to make sure that you're getting what you need from the investments that we're trying to make in your organizations. Before we get moving forward to the reception and to the concurrence in our lunch, I have the really, really special honor of introducing a friend of the arts education policy. We are really honored to have Mary Ann Carter here, chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, to speak to us about her view with arts. Mary Ann was unanimously confirmed as the 12th chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts just last month, a day that I clearly remember our, as our staff was abuzz with the news. As so many of you in this room know, Mary Ann's knowledge, dedication, and love for the arts make her a phenomenal leader and a spokesperson for the endowment. During her tenure at the National Endowment for the Arts, she's been successful in many ways. One important example is her work to strengthen Poetry Out Loud, a national arts education program that encourages the study of great poetry, which you'll hear during our student performance later this morning. Mary Ann has been on the ground sharing the powerful contributions arts have had in the communities throughout our country. And luckily, she gives us a roadmap of where she's at if you follow her on Twitter. I know that I saw recently she was in Alaska when Governor Dunleavy actually restored arts funding in Alaska for their Council on the Arts. Mary Ann is a respected leader who doesn't hesitate to dive in and offer help for many of your organizations and definitely for AEP. She has made numerous connections and has done outreach on behalf of AEP so many times and we can't thank her for the strong partnership that she's created for us. Please join me in welcoming Mary Ann Carter to the stage. Good morning. Uh, before I start my remarks, I just want to um, take a note um, and mention that it's 9 11, and um, it's been 18 years since that fateful day. And when you think of it a different way, it's been a generation. The kids who are seniors this year in high school weren't born on that fateful day yet. And so while we're busy here and doing other things and living our lives, if everyone would just take a moment sometime today and just remember those victims and the survivors and the first responders who through their bravery, many became victims that day or years later through illness. And um, I'll just leave it at that, but thank you. Jeremy, again, thank you so much. Thank you for your leadership and your friendship. ECS has been a wonderful partner, and Jeremy in particular, and we are so grateful. Under Jeremy's tenure, ECS has worked tirelessly to educate education policymakers about the importance of the arts and help them to understand how to actually move arts education forward across their state. Based on the research, the policy papers, the effective arts education practices, and now I'll say, and travel, I didn't know about the 820 um, or the 450 trips and the 820 requ requests. That's pretty impressive. I also want to thank the hard work of the AEP staff. They work day in and day out to ensure that students across the country have access to high quality arts education. And we are very much looking forward to continuing our work with AEP under Jamie Casper. Jamie, congratulations on your new role and welcome to AEP. <laughs> Arts education is very dear to me. Some of you have heard this story before, but it's so important how I came to this work, how I came to this job, that I think it bears repeating. My daughter has dyslexia, and it's fairly severe. She struggled when it came to traditional methods of teaching and learning. But she became a completely different student when we found a school that integrated arts into the teaching method. She no longer struggles, 
she survived, or she thrives, not just survives, she thrives. School for her was transformed from a place of frustration to an actual institution of learning. And I am so grateful. And the, and, and, and the arts aren't just important to her academic life, they are important to her personal life. She began dancing at the age of two. She is now 15 and still going strong. And again, I just can't say how grateful I am that the arts were so pivotal in my daughter's life. Two years ago, I spoke at this conference. It was actually the first official speech I accepted when I started as senior deputy chairman in January of 2017. I told you then, Jeremy will remember, that arts education will always have a home at the National Endowment for the Arts while I'm there. And I think and I hope I have been true to that. As senior deputy chairman, I asked each discipline director one day, if resources weren't an issue, what would be your wish list? What would you want to do? And Ayanna Hudson, who is our arts education director, who is not here today because so much is going on this week. She's actually in Washington at the Historically Black Colleges and University Conference. And we have a day and a half seminar over there as well. So we're trying to cover as many bases as we can. But she came to me and she said, I would like to increase our funding to AEP. And so I said, okay, we'll increase our funding to AEP. But now I'd like you to go to the Department of Education and ask them to match it. And they did. And because no good deed goes unpunished, the Department of Education <laughs> up to their amount this year and challenged us to do the same. So thank you, Sylvia. <laughs> and now, as chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, I believe part of my mission is to ensure that all students have the same opportunities for arts education that my daughter has now had. For students who struggle to make sense of certain subjects, the arts are there to break down topics into tangible, relatable concepts. For students who are learning English, the arts are there as a way for them to communicate with their peers and their teachers. And for all students, the arts inject a sense of joy, creativity, and imagination into the curriculum, making school a positive, transformational experience. And I'm really proud of the endowment's effort when it comes to arts education. Since the agency was founded in 1965, we've invested $250 million into arts education projects. Last year alone, we invested five million in direct arts education grants, which supported activities such as classroom artist residencies, after school enrichment programs, professional development opportunities, and research projects to grow the arts education field. These grants reach students across the country, from major cities to rural communities, to tribal reservations, to those experiencing long-term stays in hospitals and juvenile justice facilities. For some children, access to the arts would not exist without the National Endowment for the Arts. Roughly 40% of our arts education grantees are located in high poverty neighborhoods. And students from low-income communities are often the children with the least access to the arts, but who benefit the most. As this crowd well knows, disadvantaged students who receive arts education are three times more likely to earn a bachelor's degree than their peers who did not participate in the arts. They are more likely to have higher STEM scores, to volunteer, and to set higher career goals for themselves. 
The arts are not an extracurricular activity to break up the day between science and math. They are a critical component of success and will help our young people develop the creativity and the critical thinking they need to succeed in the 21st century. As Jeremy mentioned, I spent much of the summer traveling and I had the opportunity to see firsthand the incredible work our grantees are doing across the nation. In Portland, Oregon, I met with the administrators behind the Right Brain Initiative, along with Congresswoman Bonamici. For the past decade, the Arts Endowment has supported Right Brain's professional development project, which trains teachers, principals, art specialists, and teaching artists on how to adapt arts integration strategies into their curriculum. Congresswoman Bonamici shares the Arts Endowment's belief that the arts are a critical part of education. And it was inspiring to learn that the Right Brain Initiative is working to integrate STEAM education into elementary and middle schools across Portland. In Boston, I visited the Box Center, which received support from the Arts Endowment for their teen leadership program. This is an arts-based work-study program to help teens from underserved communities develop artistic leadership and job readiness skills. I really enjoyed meeting with the participants. I had a chance to talk with many of them. And they told me stories, not only how the program had affected their lives, but in many cases how it had transformed their lives. And in Brattle, Brattleboro, Vermont, I visited the New England Youth Theater's Adventure Program which has received both Challenge America and Arts Education grants. The Theater Adventure Program is designed for youth and adults with developmental challenges who too often feel invisible by society. But on stage, they were empowered. They were celebrated. They were valued. Everyone should have the chance to be a star and shine like that. This is the magic of the arts, that they give everyone a chance to discover their strength and their abilities that they didn't know they had. Seeing our grantees across the nation and all the work they do is truly one of the greatest privileges of this job. And I'm constantly humbled by how hard all the grantees work to make sure all of our youth are growing up with arts in their life. But I'm equally proud of our arts education work at the national level. The Arts Education Partnership is the Arts Endowment's largest investment in arts education. I'm gonna repeat a little that Jeremy repeated only because it's in my notes, but in 1995, the Arts Endowment and the U.S. Department of Education worked together to establish AEP, and we've both been funding it ever since. Our partnership with the Department of Education remained strong. A lot of that due to Sylvia, who's a great partner, <laughs> and Bonnie, who's also a great partner, and Nancy, I should point out, from our staff, um, from the National Endowment for the Arts. They really work well together. And we've been able to identify shared priorities on STEAM education, school choice, and ensuring youth and juvenile justice facilities have access to high quality education. These shared priorities and our mutual commitment to AEP has resulted in two back-to-back -back increases in AEP's federal investment. For fiscal year 2020, AEP will receive one million in federal investment 500,000 from the Department of Education and 500,000 from the National Endowment for the Arts. And I will just say I am really proud to be leading the National Endowment for the Arts at this time of really historic investment in arts education. As part of these funding increases, AEP has initiated new work around STEAM, the arts, and school choice and bringing arts education to juvenile justice settings. For example, AEP released a first of its kind policy brief 
on policy considerations for STEAM education and has hosted panel conversations at the Americans for the Arts Action Summit and Education Commission on the State's National Forum with state policymakers who lead those initiatives. AP convened a group of leaders in art, STEM, and education policy for a thinkers meeting to have critical conversations about STEAM to gain deeper understanding of how to move this important work forward. As part of the Arts Endowment's continued investment in AEP STEAM work, AEP will also be working with states directly to provide even more technical assistance on STEAM issues over the next 18 months. And next year, AEP will also be taking on an additional focus on juvenile justice and arts education. In the first year of work in this issue area, AEP will explore policies, practices, and research on the role of the arts in prevention, intervention, rehabilitation, transition, and re-entry as it pertains to children and youth intersecting with the juvenile justice system. As an agency, the Arts Endowment has further expanded its commitment to bringing arts education to juvenile justice settings through its Shakespeare in American Communities program. This year, the Arts Endowment has awarded grants to eight theater companies to serve youth in juvenile justice facilities, which will include activities such as acting workshops, text analysis, theater games, and performances by participating youth. The arts are a remarkable tool for rehabilitation, and we are so pleased that we've been able to bring new resources to this population through our work at the agency and now through our work with AEP. So the Arts Endowment mission to engage and empower all youth everywhere through an excellent arts education remains strong. One program, as Jeremy mentioned, that has allowed us to reach an incredible amount of youth through the years is Poetry Out Loud. Poetry Out Loud is a national recitation contest that has reached nearly four million high school students, 60,000 teachers, and 16,000 high schools since the program launched in 2005. We have recently initiated new efforts to increase awareness of the program so that we can reach even more students across the country. It is remarkable to witness when a student discovers they have a home in poetry. If you've ever attended a POL event, either at the school, the state, or the national level, you know how incredible the impact of the program is. I could go on and on about Poetry Out Loud because I just love this program so much. But instead, I would like you to see it for yourselves. It is my great honor to introduce you to Catherine Wen, the 2019 POL Virginia State Champion. Catherine is a sophomore at Colonial Forge High School in Stafford, Virginia, which means she won the POL competition for the entire state of Virginia when she was a freshman. She described her experience with Poetry Out Loud as, quote, one of the coolest and most stressful things I've ever done, end quote. She is also passionate about acting and music. Please join me in welcoming Catherine Wen. Good morning, everybody. I just want to say thank you for having me. I never thought that I would ever get to do something like this, so I'm just very happy that I get to share something that I love doing with all of you, and I hope you enjoy. Mighty Ponds by Major Jackson. If I told you, Earl, the toughest kid on my block in North Philadelphia, bow-legged and ominous, could beat any man or woman in 10 moves, 
playing white. Or that he traveled to Yugoslavia to frustrate the bearded masters at the Belgrade Chess Association? You'd think I was given to hyperbole. And if at dinner time I took you into the faint light of his Section 8 home, reeking of onions, liver, and gravy, his six little brothers fighting on a broken love seat for room in front of a cracked flat screen, one whose diaper sags. It's a wonder it hasn't fallen to his ankle. The walls behind doors exposing the sheetrock, the perfect O of a handle, and the slats of stairs missing, where baby boy gets stuck trying to ascend to a dominion foreign to you and me, with its loud timbales and drums blasting down from the closed room of his cousin whose mother stands on a corner on the other side of town, all times of day and night, except when her relief check arrives at the beginning of the month. You get a better picture of Earl's ferocity after school, on the board, but not necessarily when he stands near you at a downtown bus stop in a jacket size too small, hunching his shoulders around his ears as you imagine the checkered squares of his poverty and anger and prey. He does not turn his precise gaze too long in your direction, for fear he blames you and proceeds to take your queen. to that of the Emperor Hui Zang, who called his own calligraphy the slender gold. A nervous man writes nervously of a nervous world and so on. Miraculous. It is as though the world were a great writing. Having said so much, let us allow there is more to the world than writing. Continental faults are not bare, convoluted fissures in the brain. Not only must the skaters soon go home, but also the hard inscription of their skates is scored across the open water, which long remembers nothing, neither wind,
Sit and Sew by Alice Moore Dunbar Nelson. I sit and sew, a useless task it seems. My hands grown tired, my head weighed down with dreams. The panoply of war, the martial tread of men, grim-faced, stern-eyed, gazing beyond the ken of lesser souls, whose eyes have not seen death, nor learned to hold their lives but as a breath, that I must sit and sew. I sit and so my heart aches with desire, that pageant terrible, that fiercely pouring fire. On wasted field and writhing grotesque things, once men. My soul in pity flings appealing cries, yearning only to go there, in that holocaust of hell, those fields of woe. But I must sit and so. The little useless scene, the idle patch, why dream I here beneath my homely thatch when there they lie in sodden mud and rain pitifully calling me the quick ones and the slain? You need me. Christ, it is no rosy dream that beckons me, this pretty futile scene. It stifles me. God, must I sit and sew?